I said, so I'd rather be there if she does pass away. And I said, I don't want to see her anyway, because I don't want to remember her like that. You know, I want to remember her how she was, that strong, independent woman that raised two boys. You know, that's, that's the picture I want to keep. So, yes, yeah, she looks she's just old and frail. No, because she's already, my brother said she's already forgotten who I am. Because he was showing pictures. Look, this is Marty. These are your grandkids. And she's like, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, just... so, yeah, no. But my brother is like, <laughs> he's shocked. He's just shocked. You know, but I'm like, I've been gone for so long. Yeah. You know, that that's how they do it. They, the ones that are most recent, they'll remember. And the ones that are distant, you know, push back. Oh, really? I guess it's different with my mom. And she's she remembers things in the past. Like she she sees me and she's like you you're such a grown man now like <laughs> and you're like you're so skinny as a kid I'm like okay yeah. <laughs> <No. laughs> she's having a tough time with my brother too he has to keep reminding her you know. all right nine o'clock I need to officially start class um, as if you got my email I just got back from Washington D.C. I'm tired and I'm sore. Like I just from the the plane ride, I worked out this morning. It felt great, but I'm just I'm achy. Do you guys feel that way, or am I just getting old? No, the plane seats aren't way. built for guys like us. Yeah, they're <laughs> built for very small people. <laughs> so the uh, the conference was fascinating. So it was, um, it was it was run by the National Science Foundation in partnership with the AAAS. That's the Academy of Sciences. I don't know what the AAA is. It's science, and uh, and. Uh, some interesting talks. So, uh, and a lot of it was talking about the workforce and uh, where we're going with the workforce. Uh, so, it's projected that 47% of jobs right now are going to be lost to AI and automation. And the scary thing is, those numbers were determined by using machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> And, and now we're looking like, okay, what does it mean to have workforce? What is the workforce going to do uh, as AI and automation comes up? What are we going to do? How are we going to change things? And, and uh, other things. There are, what's also interesting, there are 7 million jobs right now that are not filled. So 7 million in, in the STEM fields. So, and, and I was there. People kept on asking me if I wanted a job. <laughs> so... Which makes me feel good, I guess. But you know, like, hey, you want a job? I'm like, no, no, I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry, you're not gonna lose me yet. But uh, and 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 uh, it was eye-opening for me too, in, in a way, because they talked about uh, the struggles that all college students go through, and and what surprised me was the homelessness and the food security. That 20% of community college students are considered homeless, although, uh, like. 10% are definitely homeless, and another 10% are, are what, what I would call couch surfing. And, but that's one fifth, one fifth or greater of the student population. And one third or greater faces um, food and housing insecurity. So that, I do believe the housing insecurity here, but the food, I just, I was just amazed that you have students that haven't eaten for two days. So I don't know. Well, we don't have to talk about this here now. But it's just that was that was and for me personally. I mean, not that I'm from a wealthy family, but I've never been hungry. I mean, not like except for like maybe camping or hiking or something like that. Then I, you know, like yeah, I'm hungry. But that's like you know, that's that's my choice. You know, but it's not. I guess I've also fasted. You know, but <coughs> but never never like oh I can't eat today. Like oh I just have to wait two days until I get some money. Like that's never happened to me. But anyways, we can. I haven't. I don't know what to do with this knowledge either. <laughs> so, but um, also interesting things. Um, they had some industry partners. They had someone from Amazon. It wasn't Bezos. It was someone up high though. His name was Ken. I forget his last name, but uh, he was interesting uh, and and uh, very articulate. Uh, and uh, he, I, um, uh, both him and there was also an executive from Exxon Mobil. And I asked both of them. I'm like. Hey, I teach freshman chemistry. Is is there anything I'm doing that's outdated? Am I teaching anything wrong? And uh, the resounding answer was no. I'm doing everything properly. I asked about written communication. So um, what the Amazon guy, what what um, 
what he had to say was that uh, written communication is important, but also, I mean, we kind of do it incorrectly in academia, you know, like, I mean, a formal lab report who, I mean, although a formal lab report is important, but Amazon is really big on, on written communication. Uh, he also said that um, the way that we teach math is incorrect, uh, that like in, like in high school, grade school, it's all geared towards algebra. And the jobs right now, many of the jobs, not all the jobs, but the jobs are, are um, in, uh, in big data. So, I mean, Amazon's really into big data, and like where everyone is trying to gear toward the algebra calculus pathway, saying we're, getting, we're trying to train people, but they just, they're not used to big numbers. Like, and, and that's where we want people to understand these huge arrays of numbers. How do we do that? And, and I mean, of course, we have statistics, and we teach that here. It's Math 115. It's now an option take Math 115 instead of 103 for some majors like psychology, or uh, Math 100. You can take 115 instead of Math 100. Math 100 is survey of mathematics. So, but I mean, it, like a, a one semester class versus, you know, uh, a, just a generalized pathway of, of, of algebra. I mean, are we really adequately preparing people for those jobs? And the answer is no. But, I mean, We'll see what the future has to say. Uh, the Exxon Mobil guy, he was very adamant. Uh, he's more of a physicist, I think. He talked about Ohm's law. He says Ohm's law hasn't changed. So the nice thing about you guys, at least re-verified for me, I am doing the, the proper thing in your class, in your, in your uh, studies here. And what you're learning is valuable. Even though chemistry hasn't changed since 1960, I mean, it's still the same thing. I mean, they still, industry uh, still wants people to, to know uh, like the law of gravity, the Newton's laws, right? You need to know Newton's law, you need to know Ohm's law, and you need to know uh, the basics of chemistry. So it's not like we're, we're doing that. And, and, but I was also saying, well, I really feel like I'm teaching the students problem solving and, and, uh, and the Excel mobile, like, that's great, that's great you're doing that, and that's a long lasting thing, but don't forget some of your students, who knows? Maybe they are gonna go on, and, and uh, I still need to teach the quantum mechanical model, because what happens if you end up being a laser spectroscopist. What happens if you go on and, and start studying physics? You still need that too, so. I guess it was validation for me, but in a way. But uh, it's interesting, it's interesting. And there's lots of struggles. Lots and lots of struggles, jeez. Anyways, uh, anybody have any questions about anything before we start? Going on talking about the hard sciences. Okay, so where are we at? We're in chapter three. And chapter three, three is dealing with stoichiometry. This is the chemical accounting. So we're in the uh, very important, but, but uh, the, the um, kind of mathematically slow chemical accounting uh, basis of chemistry. And starting here, what is the mass percent of chlorine in freon 112? So C2, Cl4, F2. So celebrity jeopardy. I like celebrity jeopardy because I can actually know some of the questions, right? Because they're... You know, celebrity jeopardy question, what three elements make up chlorofluorocarbons? Chlorine, fluorine, and carbon, right? So think about that when you have, when you hear some of these names of things that, that uh, in science, the, the name is oftentimes inclusive of what's in it. So chlorofluorocarbons. So now we, we've replaced this with... Uh, Hydrofluorocarbons, can you guess which elements are in hydrofluorocarbons? Hydrogen, fluorine, and carbon, right? So, and the reasoning for that is, is uh, the um, ozone layer. And unfortunately, this is really unfortunate that, that CFCs are, um, are da have environmental damage because they're amazing molecules. They're so safe. They're so safe. Like, let's say uh, we're sitting here, and I guess we don't have an air wall unit. But say you're, 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 you're like have an air wall unit, and a lot of times is use CFCs, and suddenly you hear a, and you know we hear CFCs coming in the room, you know, or like, you know, of course I, we leave the room and open up the doors and that kind of stuff. But you know, is anyone going to be injured from that? No. You can drink them. The liquids ones, you can drink them. You can breathe them. The only danger they have is that they displace oxygen. And if you drink them and you throw up, you can, you can have them, you can aspirate your lungs. They can go in your, and cut your, your what, alveoli, I think it's called, around your lungs. But that's just because if they block oxygen, it can kill you. But 
They're extremely safe, very, very safe chemicals. But unfortunately, ozone depletion. So calculate the mass percent of this. And many times when I'm doing this, the students say, well, what equation should I use for this? Uh, so this, this is what's considered to be science and chemistry common sense. So how do you calculate my body fat percentage? Well, I want to know what my body fat percentage is. So I go and I, well, I mean, of course, they, they, have, the, the, they have like the weight displacement things and little electrodes now or whatever, you know. But let's say, you know, the, I mean, a way you could do it is figure out how much fat I have and divide it by my mass, right? So if I am a 100-pound person, I'm not 100 pounds, you know, but I mean, and 20 of my pounds are fat, then I'm 20 divided by 100. 20 pounds of fat over my fat plus everything else. That's my body fat percentage. Right, so what is the mass percent of chlorine? Well, it's the mass of chlorine over everything. And how do we figure out that? Well, this is from the periodic table. And so, uh, so C2, Cl4, F2. So we need to have the mass of chlorine over the total mass. So what is the mass of chlorine? Chlorine is going to be 4 and the periodic table 35.45. And where am I getting that 35.45? That number in the bottom. Right? There's chlorine. The fluorine above that is 19. Carbon is 12.01. And no, you don't need to memorize it. It's just me. So then we need the mass of carbon, 2 times 12, plus 4 is still the chlorine, 35.45, plus 2 times 19 for the fluorines. And that's a trivial conversation. Calculate. I, might, I might just look this one up. Actually, maybe I'll put it in the calculator. What the heck? I'm feeling productive this morning. Not really. My foster cats woke me up in the middle of the night. <laughs> and they bit me in the bum. Mm thing I don't like about this thing, and it's a free app, but I keep on having to look at ads every time I make a calculation. And so obviously here, this is 69.16, however many we want to use, 69.6%. And we don't have any, it doesn't, it's, the number of sig figs isn't quite, quite clear, but okay. So some of the things to note, uh, when you put this in your calculator, make sure you put the put divide by the entire quantity, because otherwise that would be a mix up in order of operation. Uh, no, uh, yeah, order of operations. And just for myself, I put in 24 and 38. I just did that in my head real fast. And some, some things with math. So, so when I see 2 times 19, I think of that as 40 minus 2. So I just it's easier to see 2 times 20 is easier to me for 40. And then take 1 away for each. So just 40 minus 2 is easier to me, however you want to do it. In your head, though, but if you, you can, if you, uh, for math, if you uh, rearrange things, sometimes it's easier to look at it that way. Of course, you can always just put the numbers in the calculator. If you put the numbers in the calculator properly, that's fine. 
but I've also, like for me in grad school, being trained to make calculations on the fly is our, part of our hazing, if you will, that, you, that I went through. So I kind of, I would automatically, when I look at calculations, I'm like, okay, what is this gonna be about? And other common sense things, I mean, looking at this, I would guess that to be around 50%, just looking at it. I would, I would expect a number around 50%. And with any percentages, if you get a, over 100%, you, knew, you did something wrong. So, questions with this? So, recap, what's the mass percent of chlorine something? Take the mass of chlorine over the total mass, just like body fat percentage. What's your, how much fat you have over how much uh, your, the rest of your stuff is. That's true for anything, your, your bone density, your, your bone percentage, I don't know. Okay, moving on. Chemical formulas is conversion factors. So hydrogen might be used to replace gasoline as a fuel. Um, we're, looking, we're looking at the see if we can run vehicles on hydrogen. And how can we do this is use an emission free source such as wind power to get the hydrogen. So what mass of hydrogen in grams is contained in a one, in one gallon of water? So, so all these things. And so remember, if you're going to work at Amazon, you have to take lots and lots of data. So lots and lots of data. Look at this paragraph of, you know, contains tons of beautiful data in this paragraph. And which, what information is useful? Not very much of it. All we need to know, we can get rid of the first thing and say, what mass of hydrogen? So we need mass of hydrogen grams and one gallon of water. So uh, that's, that's uh, and the rest of that stuff is just extra information that we don't even need. The big data is kind of, it's kind of scary in a way. And the, the ad that came up for this when I was doing the calculator is, Hey, why don't you sign up for Google Photos? That way we can look at all your photos too. They know a lot of things about us now. Okay, so how are we gonna get there? We give information is that we have a gallon of water, and water, like uh, well, and some of this consider considered common sense. Water is H2O, so that's kind of considered common sense. And what we need is mass of hydrogen in grams. So. Let's do this, uh, and the way we're gonna do this is dimensional analysis. So we have one gallon, and, and we have to get over here, we have to get from one gallon to grams of hydrogen. So we're going there, how do we get there? Uh, so, of course this chemistry class, we think of moles, we have to get to moles water. <coughs> And so we're gonna have to convert this to moles, and then moles back to, to uh, then, then break it apart to get the hydrogen, then break it back. So how do we get to moles of water? So gallon, gallon is a very uh, difficult thing to use. How about liters? There are 3.78 liters in a gallon. And I know that because they say on milk jugs. Well, actually says 3.8 liters in milk jugs, but I know it's 3.78. So I bet you can look that up. How can you figure that out? It'll be in a test, it'll be in a conversion. If not, you can use the wonderful equipment that we have. How many liters are in a gallon? Come on, Google, don't tear me now. There are 3.785. Ooh, maybe I should put. The Google has corrected me. Okay, and then we have thousand milliliters in a liter and then we have one gram per liter so now we're at grams water so there is a mole water to 18.01 grams water I could I usually just drop the point zero one but it's 18 grams per mole and then there are two moles hydrogen to mole H2O, and there's 1.008 grams hydrogen to um, mole hydrogen. And if you if you want, uh, you can include 
another step here. Ah, what the heck? Let's just multiply by one. I'll, I'll go ahead and include it. To be proper, Okay, let me zoom in so you can see my, my writing. So one gallon is 3.785 liters. Then we convert to milliliters. Now we have, oh, this is one gram per milliliter, sorry. Milliliter. And now we're converting to, we have grams water. I didn't put grams water, but it's grams water. Now we're at mole water. And here's this next step, two moles hydrogen to mole water. That's just like we did the previous problem. The amount of chlorine in that CFC, this is the amount of hydrogen and water. Okay, so we've already covered that skill. And now we're converting back. And I, I, uh, I'm doing it this way because I guess it's, it's more proper. I, this is because a uh, mole of hydrogen is two, is two parts hydrogen atoms, like H2 diatomic. And then uh, what I originally wrote on there was 1.008 grams hydrogen per mole hydrogen. So, but it's just this way. It's multiple. This is this way. I've divided by two and multiplied by two. So it's mathematically it's the same thing. But I guess unit wise, do the same thing. I think it's like 450. What is the answer of this question? Oh, this is two. Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. What am I doing? Okay. And this is 423. The answer here is 423 grams of hydrogen. So what does this mean, though? So 423 grams, that's not even a pound. So a gallon of water weighs about about 8 pounds. So uh, and that means from a gallon of water, you get uh, just a little less than a pound of, of hydrogen. So, and if you hadn't, if you haven't figured it out, it says this is, this is hydrogen may potentially be used. And this is, we, we might use, uh, this is called hydrolysis. We might do hydrolysis of water to get hydrogen. And uh, so this is not how we get hydrogen. We use hydrogen. Uh, anyone want to guess what we use it for primarily? To make fertilizer. Ammonia is NH3. We use hydrogen to make fertilizer. Uh, but uh, hydrogen comes from two sources. Number one is called steam reformation. We take methane, natural gas, we react it with steam, with water, to form hydrogen and carbon dioxide. So that's one way. The other way is uh, we get it from oil refinery. So if you reform molecules, what does reforming mean? It means you take uh, a chain of carbon and you reform it, you cyclize it. And that's called reformation. When you cyclize it, hydrogen pops off. It's a byproduct. And uh, one interesting fact about the United States, uh, we have 50 states and we have 50 different laws for gasoline blends. Each state has its own set of rules. We don't have, uh, the United States, we do some things very inefficiently here. So we have 106 nuclear power plants, for instance, and we have 106 different types of nuclear power plants. We do not have, if you look at, uh, so Southwest, the airline Southwest, they only buy Boeing jets. And they, um, and Boeing actually is really expensive. And of course, Boeing is going down in popularity since their last debacle. But uh, Southwest has a very low amount of overhead, especially for their mechanics and their parts. Since it's all one company, they all type one type. There's one type of mechanic that has one type of training that has one toolkit. Versus if you have other airlines that have multiple different carriers, you suddenly have to have a bunch more tools lying around, a bunch of different training. There's like, like well, I can handle Airbuses. I don't know, there's Boeing crap. You know, so uh, having one set of thing, one standardized thing, can be very efficient. It's like shopping at Costco. Less choices. Kind of thing. So, uh, but, that is one unfortunate thing about the, the United States. We do like to have, we do make things complicated sometimes. And that's, 
with our with our gasoline laws and our and our some of our plant designs, it's true. Makes it a little more dangerous. Uh, okay, but um, so that's where we really get hydrogen. But wind power. One thing about wind power is it's not very useful. So if you look at wind power, it's it's not very useful. Uh, it was very useful. I'm sure it was very useful yesterday. Uh, and we got the the uh, SSM folks here too. <laughs> it was running at tw we, the uh, the wind was at 25 miles an hour. At least that's what they when my flight landed. They said winds are at 25 miles an hour. It's 92 degrees. I'm like, oh man, hot day. You know, but but then you know that's nice about that wind. It was generating electricity, and people were probably using the electricity for climate control. Of course, here when the trade winds die down, it gets really hot. And then we run our ACs, even though there's no wind power. And what are we doing? We burn more oil. And one thing about the electrical grids, they need to be constantly energized. So uh, because of that, even in the, the wind power, it's a variable source. So it, it gives spikes and then lows into the grid system. And how do we, how do we deal with that? How does the, the grid deal with that? And essentially, we lose a lot of power. It's a lot of electricity that's just not used, or it can't even be put in the grid because it'll surge it. So we have this unusable electricity that's inconsistent. So what can we do with this unusable electricity? And maybe making fuel is a good idea. And that's an idea of hydrogen, so hydrogen fuel. And why do we use gasoline? You know, why, why should we use gasoline? If we could pick any fuel, why do we use gasoline? Uh, and it's because it's the safest. So gasoline, it's, it's uh, you say it's safe, I can't drink that. Well, uh, it's very chemically inert. So you, if you go like a, like a flex fuel, uh, you, can, you can put ethanol in an engine, it'll run it. I mean, NASCAR, NASCAR cars, NASCAR, they run off of ethanol. So why, like, why don't we just run the cars off of ethanol? Uh, what's so special about it? Well. For one thing, uh, making it, we, we make it biologically now. We can't do it chemically yet. But uh, uh, gasoline has uh, two-thirds the, the uh, energy of, I'm sorry, ethanol has two-thirds the energy of gasoline. Meaning if you can run, a, if you can drive 100 miles on gasoline, you can drive 66, 67-ish miles on ethanol. And so you get a, you get a greater range. And uh, ethanol is just, just breaks things down more. Uh, the flex fuel cars, what's different about a flex fuel car versus a regular gasoline car is the tubes. The tubes are different. That's all that's different. You can turn any car into a flex fuel fuel car. You just have to replace all the fuel lines and uh, probably your fuel filters for a while, unless it's a new car. So that's the only thing that's different is the tubing. And uh, it, the tubing is a bit more expensive, but that's not a big deal. So, uh, and think tanks, they, and they, they've done this in Washington, D.C. What if? What if we, we uh, just ran everything off ethanol? Uh, how about methanol? We can make methanol. That's easy. Uh, methanol uh, is uh, pretty toxic. I mean, it's very toxic to humans and the environment. But methanol has 44% uh, the uh, energy of gasoline. So if you can go 100 miles, now you can go 44. And not so much of a big issue here, but on the US mainland, uh, if you've noticed when you go across the interstates, there's exits about every 30-ish miles. Why do we have exits every 30-ish miles? Because if the fuel light goes on in your car, you can make it to the next exit and refuel. So what are we going to do? Well, we'd have to build twice as many exits. So now we, if, we, if we are going to switch fuels, now we have to, there's going to be, in, in, is that the right thing to do environmentally? So OK, so we have a different fuel. But now we have, to, we have to construct twice as many <coughs> communities on our interstates to go around that. So these are like these hard questions, like what, do you, what are we answering? What does this mean? So other thing about hydrogen, hydrogen especially, hydrogen is literally a rocket fuel. It's explosive. It's very, very explosive. Gasoline vapors are explosive, but gasoline by itself tends not to be. If you, I mean... Uh, if you light a match on gasoline, you can get the whole thing to, to burn, but it tends to burn just like a torch kind of thing. It doesn't, it tends not to just suddenly explode, not like in the movies, uh, right? Yeah. I know, I know. The video games too, I hate to break it to you. Um, 
But uh, so gasoline is safe in that regards, that you can get into a collision and, and not have a, a detonation. Uh, whereas hydrogen, oh yeah, good. Uh, so these are the, some of the things, you know. And uh, the Air Force looked into this. I mean, talk about the, the number one consumer of, of uh, fuel in the world is the United States Air Force. So not surprising. The single largest entity is the US military. Of the branches of the military, Air Force uses the most fuel. Not surprising. Uh, they can pick any fuel that they want. I mean, come on now, the budget of the US military is like, somewhere like $600 billion-ish. I don't know, I don't know. It's huge. They can, they could, they could run their, their aircraft with like, I don't, I don't know, liquid gold if they wanted to. Uh, but they use JP-9. Why do they use JP-9? Uh, because it's the most energy in the smallest space. The sa it's the same, basically the same jet fuel. It's kerosene. Why, why do they do that? Well, they said, well, we could use hydrogen. What is that going to mean for the aircraft? We can use uh, natural gas. And what they found out was that if you use another fuel that doesn't have as much energy density, you have to have a bigger wingspan, and then you have to have a narrower cabin. So that means the wings would be bigger, so the, and that's where the fuel typically is in the wings. So the wings are going to be bigger, and the cabin's going to be smaller. And not only that, there's the other issues. Uh, in, in uh, especially World War II, the, um, using the, uh, and the Japanese had this, when like a, a zero fighter used gasoline, the high octane, and if you hit that with bullets, it'll explode. I mean, I just told you that, that <laughs> gasoline cars don't explode. I mean, it's different if you have an explosive round versus a fender bender collision that has a few sparks. So, uh, so it, and, it, but the Air Force does get shot at. And hitting it with one bullet, taking down a big jet, that's a possibility with a hydrogen fuel tank. But even more importantly, just for transport, that you would, you would have to have bigger wings and less cargo, which means you'd also have to have more planes. And they're like, this is stupid. We should use jet fuel. We should use JP-9. So then those are things that if you look at some of the, the think tanks that they're doing. OK, so this is just more conversion stuff. We're getting to things that you're actually going to do. It's coming up next. So, so pay attention for this one, because gonna, we're going to then go and use this information for a problem for you to do. So a compound containing nitrogen and oxygen decomposed laboratory produces 24.5 grams of nitrogen and 70 grams of oxygen. What is the empirical formula of the compound? So uh, for a while, and by a while I mean like in the 18th century, chemistry, among other things, was what's in this stuff? We started to figure out what atoms were, and a lot of people were saying, you know, like, and, and they all had, like if you've seen some of the movies, like I, I like that Sherlock Holmes movie, and they have these weird names, you know, what is this? This essence of, of something, I don't know, this, I, I can't think of one off the top of my head, like muriatic acid, there we go, there's one, hydrochloric acid, you know, what is in muriatic acid? What elements make up muriatic acid? And so that was, chemistry was, was really focused in on. And uh, one of the easiest ways, which I like, one of the ways you could find out what is something is made of is you can burn it. <laughs> Combustion analysis. And they can <laughs> then you can calculate or collect the water, calculate the carbon dioxide, calculate or calculate, collect what else is in there, and then you can uh, then you can kind of backtrack and determine what's it, what it's made of. So this is one of them that that uh, you you've probably taken it and burned it a little bit. Also another thing with oxygen, oxygen for a while was a mystery uh, because mm -hmm. oxygen sometimes was calculated as missing mass because when you burn something, it forms water and carbon dioxide. And that oxygen is both of those, and it just adds. It, and so we're like, oh, we thought we had this much mass, but we can't find this mass. Where'd it go? And then oxygen, in part, was discovered because of that. OK, so let's do this. We have 24.5 grams of nitrogen. I'll zoom in. So 24.5 grams of nitrogen. And we have 70.0 grams of oxygen. So chemistry class, knee-jerk reaction, moles. So uh, what are we going to do here? Figure out what's in this stuff. And the empirical formula, this is the lowest ratio 
of atoms. So we got to get to moles. We got to get the moles, and then we got to compare them to see how many of each they have, and then we can come up with a with a formula. So that's how we solve this problem. So think in terms of moles and mole nitrogen to 14. 14 grams nitrogen, mole oxygen to 16 grams oxygen. So let me run my calculator. I wonder what big data is going to find out about me now. 5 divided by 14. This is 1.75. 70 divided by 16. 4.375. Okay. So what do we do now? We go, okay, this is N 1.75, <coughs> oxygen 4.375, and we're done. No, you're not done. Because uh, chemistry is discrete mathematics. You have to deal with whole numbers. You, what does 1.75 nitrogen atoms look like? Look like? I know what one, ad, one atom looks like. I know what two atoms look like. You know, what is, what is 1.75 of a person like? Just a big person. I guess I'm 1.75 people. No, not really. I'm one person. I'm just different, different elements. So we have to divide by the lowest. We divide both sides by 1.75. And in doing so, we get a ratio of 1 to 2.5. And again, you're like, all right, nitrogen, oxygen, 2.5. No, nope, still wrong, right? Because you can't have an a half of an oxygen atom. So what do you do? You multiply by 2, and you get N2O5. And you're done. So the question is that I get after this is, uh, how do we know what to multiply by things by? Well, if it's 0.5, <coughs> you multiply by 2. If it's 0.33, you multiply by 3. If it's 0.25, you multiply by 4. If it's 0.2, you multiply by 5. Good old fractions. Okay, so a recap with this one. Compound has nitrogen and oxygen, uh, and it's got 2.45 grams of nitrogen and 70 grams of oxygen. What is the empirical formula? Well, uh, Knee-jerk reaction chemistry, moles. What is this made of? What, how many moles of stuff do we have? So we figure out the molar ratio. The molar ratio is 1.75 moles of nitrogen to 4.375 moles of oxygen. So then we divide by the lowest number to get a 1 to 2.5 ratio of nitrogen to oxygen. And then since we deal with whole numbers, we have to multiply it by 2 to get rid of the half to get N2O5. Questions with this? So um, if you notice, uh, maybe you've noticed, sometimes I do, I call it a recap. I say, OK, this is what we've done. Uh, if you're wondering what I'm doing, uh, so if you study educational theory and the role between the instructor and the student, so the instructor's job is to communicate clearly, and among other things, but communicate clearly. And uh, also then the student, your job is to obviously learn and also integrate the knowledge. So uh, the integration of the knowledge in your head is something that only the student can do. So that's something that, that no matter how good of a communicator I am, I cannot integrate the knowledge in your head to tie the concepts together, to make them meaningful. This is something that is entirely the responsibility of the student. So, uh, but what I'm, what I'm attempting to do with the recap, I'm trying to take those individual points and, I mean, yeah, the, the teacher can teach the individual points. You get this point, yes. You get this point, yes. You get this point, okay. I verified you get each of these points. Now you've got to combine them together. And I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to help you combine them together by the recap if you're wondering why I'm doing this. Also, you have a question? Where did you get the... the the 14. Okay, quite a good question. The 14 is from the periodic table. Oh, okay. Right there. 
Other questions? Right at the end, um, when you, you got to 2.5, yeah. could you pick it up from there? Uh, just... be because uh, you can't have a half of an atom. So, so the, the 0.5 fraction, you have to multiply by 2. And 2.5 times 2 is 5. And that's just, just uh, getting, multiplying uh, by terms to get rid of the, because uh, what the math that we're using is called continuous mathematics, where it's, there's an infinite number of points that we can deal with. But since chemistry deals with the, the uh, discrete mathematics, we, um, we have to change the way that we do math. So, and the other thing, mathematics, math is a model. Okay, math is not real. Math is a model, uh, and we, it describes the world, but we look, maybe we we'll talk later. <laughs> so I understand using the two to get rid of the fraction, but how did you get to N205, where that splits like that? How did you get there? Oh, because you have to multiply nitrogen by two. Because the ratio, the ratio before you multiply by two is N2, N nitrogen just by itself, that's one N. This is one nitrogen and 2.5 oxygens. Okay, so you're multiplying both sides. Yeah, you have to, thank yeah. you. Got it. So you have to multiply the whole thing by two. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? All right. Ibuprofen is 75.69% carbon, 8.8% hydrogen, and 15.51% oxygen. What is the empirical formula? So let's work on this together. And, and I'll start you off. If you give a percentage, uh, how do we go from percentage to mass? The easiest thing I would do is I multiply by 100. Pick any number. I like things easy. So uh, with, with uh, an, another thing called being lazy, I, I think it's better to be strategic. When you are solving problems, it's best to be strategic. So we have 75.69 grams of carbon. Just multiply it by 100. 8.8 .8 grams of hydrogen, and then 15.51 grams of oxygen. And I'll give you this far. Moles carbon over 12.01 grams carbon. Moles hydrogen. 1.008 grams hydrogen, and then moles oxygen to 16.0, or it's not just 16, 16 grams oxygen. So. So go ahead and break into groups. Is anybody stuck? Anybody need help? No one needs help yet. OK. I will take my teaching seriously now, and I will take a strategic break then. Uh, but seriously, anybody? No one's stuck? Everyone's cool? OK. And I'll even. Make it even bigger.
Those are pretty big. I mean, we can deal with 500. Let's be real. Six with 23 zeros after it is not kind of radical. So, so we took that and, and and if you look at carbon here, so carbon with this, so we have seven. Say I have a thousand grams of nickels. I think it's kilogram of nickels. So, and let's say a nickel is uh, ten grams. This means I have 100 nickels. Right? So if, I'm, if, I'm, if I have a big bucket of nickels and each nickel is 10 grams, I weigh it, and from that I can say, oh, I have this many nickels. Right? Same idea as this. If I have 75 grams of carbon and I know that a mole of carbon is this much carbon, I can then calculate out. analysis like how many how many minutes in a day 24 so one day is 24 hours so day no, 24 hours a day then uh, 60 minutes to every hour okay well so, so, so someone yeah yeah, I look at a lot of mine ones, which are probably easier than the ones that are just a bunch of random values. Yeah. Okay.
What is this? What is this whole problem? Science. Science. Yeah. Oh, question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I got this far, but I think I'm going in the wrong direction. So now you got to divide by the lowest number. Which is <laughs> right. I did that so that that was number one, and then I divided all the other yeah. ones. Yeah. That's close enough. Man. You can do six point five and nine. Yeah. Just go straight nines? Yeah. Oh, okay, that's where I went wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, then. Yeah, this is right. You that's got it. right? Yeah. yeah. Well, how do you, how do you get rid of it? You just, you, get the, you, you just drop it. Yeah. Like it's that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, just yeah. Because I was like, you had to multiply by 50. I'm like, yeah. that's not even. Yeah. Close. <laughs> okay. So some of these have four yeah. subjects, and some of like, I thought that wouldn't this one have the same graph yeah. over here? But so that threw me off. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so like, if you if you do the carbon there, you get six point four nine seven. Uh huh. Oh, right, right. So what is what is it? What are the couple sig figs? We can. I mean, you keep, there's always gonna be a little bit of error. So that's. But um, but what I'm I guess what I'm asking is I noticed that these this one and this yeah. have the same amount 
sick pigs, but we went yeah. with this here, we went with that there. Yeah. Okay, I see your point. Does it matter? Um, Is there a any? A little bit. Okay. A little bit. So this is what this is what that is doing that and then it's kind of nice store it's something. Let's let's write it down. Okay, so now you have six point three zero two divided by point nine six Nine three seven five, and even even there, so you get like even then the four sig figs that would be six point five zero one. Mm -hmm. So then, how are you gonna get rid of that really small fraction? And, and the thing well, is, that that does lead into my second question: um, Why did we get to keep the six point five? Because it's a ratio. Ra ratios are fine. Oh, okay. yeah, I mean, we're not dealing with whole numbers yet. Okay. Then you multiply it all by two. Because over here, we went through all this trouble yeah. to get whole numbers. Yeah. And now here, we're, it doesn't matter. Oh, no, 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 no. I haven't gotten there. You multiply by two to get uh, 13. Oh. That's so not the end. Okay. <laughs> Goodness gracious. <laughs> yeah. When, so, I'm, so I'm thinking my line of thinking is correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's a miracle. Okay. Well, yeah. Indeed. Yeah, no, it's I mean, we're going in, we're going through it slowly. <laughs> I wanted you guys to work on your own, and then I come back. <laughs> it's a nice yeah. The whole day, hey, this, everything by two. Everything by two, dude. Yeah. C13. Mm-hmm. You get it. N, H, D, N. H or N? H. Is it H? It's H. H, D, T. And do you always multiply by two? We always multiply by two. To get rid of, to get rid of the half. The half. <laughs> okay, so I think, I, I mean, just kind of going around, it looks like everyone is kind of converged, or at least I think everyone's converged. That, I mean, the ratio of carbon to hydrogen oxygen is 6.5 to 9 to 1. What do you do here? We have to have a half. Can't have a half. So you multiply by two. And then you have 13 to 18 to 2. So it's C13, H18, O2. So that's one thing. I got a question coming around. So uh, what to do with all these numbers? So uh, if you are very careful and do the, the carbon, the, the, the uh, Four sig figs. This is going to be 6.302 right here for moles of carbon. And if you take this one out, it's I said 0.97, but it's 0.969375. And then if you divide 6.302 by 0.969375, you get 6.501096. Even a four sig figs, that's 6.501. So the thing, though, this is, this is dealing with experimentation. Experimentation has a little bit of error, and which, which also now, um, when you deal with math and chemistry, you also have to understand that there's things going to be ex not going to be exact. There's going to be a little bit of errors here and there, and you have to account for that in your thinking. If I'm looking at whole numbers, I'm going to have to be able to, in my mind, to chop off that, that, that 0 0.01, that, that 0, 0, 001, and just come up with the fact that that number is equal to 6.5 in a ratio. So you have to, to do math and do it properly, but you also have to look at the math and look at the context of the math and what it means. So that's another step. So the math is not real. What real is the science and the chemistry. The physical world is real. The math is just a tool to get you there. So uh, always just maybe else, maybe it's the, maybe Amazon's right. Maybe we shouldn't just be teaching students uh, continuous mathematics all the time with an algebra pathway. Because in algebra pathway, continuous mathematics, you're like, geez, this is completely wrong. But the math is representing what's going on in the chemistry world. Chemistry actually is real. So chemistry is considered real, right? Because we deal with atoms. Atoms are, last I checked, they, they are real, you know? So 
Or at least the, maybe the computer simulation that we live in leads me to believe it's real. I don't know. But as far as we can tell, we, we don't know. Or maybe it's the simulation of the simulation in the simulation. OK. All right, so questions with this? How to do this? Uh, another thing you could have done is look previously in your notes and saw that ibuprofen is right here. Um, and which is another point. When you get tests, sometimes the answers are in the test. So uh, keep that in mind as you're taking tests uh, that, that, you know, I always read the test first, because that way I'm like, can go back and say, ha ha, silly person. Thanks for, the, thanks for the softball. All right. Questions on this? All right. So on to chapter four. So this is where we're also building up to. I, um, I, I, one time I worked as a consultant. Uh, I worked, the guy, is, his name was Robert Addington. Uh, and he's actually been in a bit of trouble because he, well, he, he lost a lot of money. He, uh, he used to own about one third of the uh, coal rights in Kentucky. And he made lots of money on coal. And uh, after, but coal has kind of gone out of style of sorts, and he's now worth much less than that. Mm -hmm. uh, he is at one point in time worth about $2 billion. And I was working for him. And this is back in 2008. And uh, he, uh, this is also when they were really starting to talk about carbon taxes. And the proposed plan was to tax uh, carbon at $30 per ton. $30 per ton CO2. And he was saying, like, I can make money off of this. I can sell carbon credits now. So we were going over to the calculations. And, and I remember he, he's telling me, he's telling me, like, why, why is there, like, how are we generating so many, like, one thing, I mean, he's a billionaire, but he didn't understand his general chemistry. And he's saying, like, how? How can one ton of CO2, why is it generating like five or six tons of carbon dioxide? I don't understand how that works. And I mean, I was just like, carbon is 12 grams per mole. CO2 is 44 grams per mole. So when you're burning it, you gain that extra mass kind of thing. That's the kind of things I would, I mean, I did other things, of course, but I'm like talking to him like, this is the reason why that does that. And, and we were looking at cars. And uh, so I can show you some of the calculations later about how he wanted to make money off of carbon credits. But... Uh, Question he had here, does your, like, like, how can we do this? Like, okay, so he wanted to sell carbon credits with his coal, is where he was going with this. And, but he was also uh, thinking about other things. He's like, okay, well, carbon dioxide, this is a valuable commodity. Let's make something out of it. And he wanted, what he was planning on doing is like, what if we capture carbon dioxide in a car? And that's one of the things I did for him, is he would come up with these crazy ideas, and I would try and figure out how, how to make it happen. What does it mean? And... So he told me, Mike, I want you to figure out how to, um, how to capture carbon from a car. And, and he gave me a couple of options. Uh, some of them were funny. He's like, what if we just put a balloon? What if we put a, car behind, a balloon behind a car? And I said, well, you know, like, uh, like imagine you have a, like a car. It's, it's like a three liter engine, say a big truck. Like a three liter engine. The truck's running at that 1,000 uh, RPM, like at idle. You know, idle 1,000 RPM, a three liter engine. That's 3,000 liters, right? And if you put a balloon behind it, you're going to fill up like a hot air balloon in a minute with that kind of, put, with that kind of stuff putting out the car, right? I mean, that's just, that's just a huge amount of, of uh, gas going through. And then he's like, well, what if you compress it down? I mean, you can just take carbon dioxide and compress it down to form dry ice. So I did some calculations on that, and I found out it would at least double or more the gas mileage because then you'd have to run a compressor which I didn't even, I guess I didn't even look at the weight. I just looked at the energy. It's like the energy that it would take to compress carbon dioxide down to form dry ice is this much energy, and that corresponds to like this much gasoline. And you're like, oh yeah, that's a bad idea. You know, kind of thing. And then what I thought, what I thought was a really, he had a really good idea on this. He's like, what if we took uh, lime, so stacked lime, and bubbled CO2 through it? And then that would form calcium carbonate. And 
because uh, calcium carbonate is a building material, and at the time China was buying up all our building materials. So like, what if we, if we turn something into a building material? And then uh, that was, I mean, that was an interesting concept, but the thing with that is, so stacked lime, it's calcium hydroxide, and putting carbon dioxide through that, it gains a mass. It goes from calcium hydroxide to calcium carbonate, and then it, it gains in mass, though, as you go along. Because usually when you drive a car, your car gets lighter. Because you burn the fuel, it gets lighter. This way you drive your car, a car gets heavier. So uh, then, but then again, you're, you're carrying all this extra mass. And then looking at the mass, and I just did some, some like, I mean, simple ratios of mass to, to um, fuel economy. I'm like, like you're going to cost this much fuel economy if you do that. And you know, he's like, yeah, that's a bad idea too. Uh, but what you want to do is like, his next... Uh, before I, I had to go, it was over summertime, and I go back to school. He's like, "How about a train?" He was like, "Okay, it doesn't work for a car. How about a train? You know, because trains are heavy. They run off they run off a diesel. So why don't we have take the exhaust from a train, and that uses that's pulling a bunch of things. Like in a car, you know, you double the mass. That's a big deal. But a train, if you if you have another another car on it, the train's already pulling 200 cars. You know, what's another car going to be on that? That's not going to damage the economy at all." So that's where, then that's where we ended. And then, you know, then the economy tanked. So, but, okay. So, but this is the kind of things that I was talking to him about. So, uh, octane. I mean, I know we just talked about there's different types of, of uh, gasoline ratios and formulations for each state. But I'm going to make it simple. Octane. So, octane plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. That's the complete combustion of gasoline. I've already, uh, we're gonna talk about balancing chemical equations, but I'm gonna skip ahead to it. This is how it's balanced. Two parts octane to 25 parts oxygen makes 16 parts CO2, 18 parts water. And by mass, that's 114 grams of octane, 32, or, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. We do our molecular mass, so the two, two moles of octane is 228 grams of octane, 800 grams of oxygen make 704 grams CO2 and 324 grams of water. And which also means 1,028 grams of reactants makes 1,028 grams of products. So this is the law of conservation of mass. We're not generating or destroying matter. We have the same amount of matter coming in and going out. So with this is the idea, does your car run off of air or fuel? Well, really, it runs off of air. I mean, we have about 200 grams of fuel reacting with 800 grams of air. So I mean, you consume by mass four times as much air as you do fuel. So, and we don't even think about it. We don't even think about it because there's so much air, right? I mean, we're not gonna run out of air. If you're driving your car, you run out of fuel. So when I think about how far I'm going to drive, I think, oh, I can drive my car until the gas can't tank is empty and I have no more fuel. So where I want to build up with this going on, that's called a limiting reagent. So this is a case we are limited by something in a car, car, and because the, the excess, we have so much air that it's unfathomable how that we could run out of air here, but uh, the fuel, the fuel can run out. Can you think of any time that we do have to worry about the air? Space, yeah. You have the fuel and the oxidizer. It's usually oxygen. It doesn't have to be. But in space, in uh, rockets right now, most of them run off of thrust. We have other types of propulsion. Uh, I mean, so, but we still mostly have chemically based thrust is our primary mode of transportation. Uh, in and around space. You can, you can have, I mean, we still need to have chemically based thrust to get ships up into space. When they're in space, we can do a couple things. You can put up big, big sails that have run up a solar wind. That's one thing that we're thinking about doing. Uh, we, we still do this frequently. Uh, you can use a gravity assist. You can, um, you can, it is the Voyager probes. So you can go around a planet and use the gravity well. You can go like, and you can accelerate that way. They've, they've done this quite a bit uh, for that. And that maybe in the future, if we get more space travel, we'll start to use the Earth or the Moon as gravity pushes, or to slow down. So either gravity assist or 
or to, to slow you down so you can re-entry, you have to use so much uh, fuel. And Russia just blew something up two weeks ago. Did you read about that? They're trying to use uh, nuclear reactions to, to, uh, to run things, and that, that expl literally exploded in their face. It's not that bad. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, if you look at radiation, though, like, um, and, they, and they weren't doing a detonation, but uh, the amount of radiation that we've released in the, in the environment is, is nuts. We've blown up you, about 500 nuclear weapons in the air. So, and Chernobyl. Chernobyl was pretty bad, but it, I mean, I guess it depends on whom you ask, I guess. I think the nuclear weapons program was far worse than Chernobyl. But anyways, uh, okay, so uh, this is what we're trying to build you up and to the connections you hope to make. And, uh, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. We still need to balance chemical equations. And so that's the next part. And a chemical equation, chemical equation, it's, uh, it's, it's like a recipe. And it's, it's nice. It, there, there is a lot of information in these recipes. So, uh, and you think of a recipe, well, you have your reactants and you have your product. So if I'm making pancakes, uh, you can, so let's see here, it's, it's like, I think it's a cup of flour to about a cup of water to an egg plus a teaspoon of salt and some baking powder. It's like one or two teaspoons of baking powder. You mix it all up and you may, that'll make you like five pancakes. I don't know. So, right, you have, so you have a certain amount of flour, certain amounts of, uh, you have an egg, you have some milk, you have some salt, and you have the baking powder. All right, so those are your reactants. And then uh, what happens when you, how you cook them and in, in a way the, the, the instructions for cooking them. Sometimes it's in the equation, sometimes it's not. And then you get your product, you get your pancakes. So in this regard, is that my, oh, that's not me. Okay. Uh, I have a shut up alarm. <laughs> um, oh, we have three minutes left. So here on the left side of the equation, this is called the reactants. These are the reactants on the right side of the product. And when you say, you say the reactants, and you can say yields forms, I guess the proper way to say yield, and you have the products. And in this way here, it tells you uh, the, this is methane. It's CH4, so one carbon to four hydrogens. And it's a gas. The G means gas. So the state is there as well. And here, two oxygens. So I know that we have two of these molecules and these, this O2 <coughs> means that there's two atoms of oxygen of O in this. So there's two of these. And each have two atoms. Forms one part of this, which has one carbon and two oxygens, one of these. And then we have two waters. And there are two of them. And they each have two hydrogens and one oxygen in each of those. So, uh, and when you do this, and also when you balance the chemical equation, you can't change these ratios between the atoms. You can't change the compounds. You change the compounds, uh, you've got a new reaction. So I can't just like put instead of H2O, I'll put H2O2. No, you can't worry. That's hydrogen peroxide. That's not water. It's something different. So, but I'll go through that. I know that, I'm, that I don't have enough time to go through this in entirety. Uh, but uh, if you back this up, you can use a word equation. Methane plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water. That is the word equation. That doesn't have as much, nearly as much information as the chemical equation, though, because it includes the states. Uh, the state is important because, I mean, water can be both a liquid and a gas. So which one is it? It changes the energy because uh, the, there's, there's more potential energy in liquid water, if you will. Well, I guess maybe not. I guess water vapor, because if you touch it, it'll condense on you. It has different energy, but that's for a different time. OK, I think I will end here now. Does anybody have any quick questions? All right, we'll continue on in chapter four. Oh, I didn't show you the calculations for carbon credits. Eh, I'll show them later. That's scary. <laughs> How did you get to the grams on the Which one? The